Jackson, thank you very much, Anthony, for being here uh, today. I, I don't know how many of you know this, but this is his first visit to India after he took over as CEO and president of Marriott. So welcome uh, back to India in your new role and thank in your you. new avatar. You know, there's a whole host of things that I want to talk to you about, Anthony, but let me start by asking you about the outlook for 2023. Uh, in your own words, 2022 was a terrific year. Uh, you had record financials. Uh, given the global uncertainties that we're seeing today, I know that you've held out a very broad assessment of mm -hmm. what uh, the 2023 outlook is. Uh, do you believe that we're likely to be at the higher end of that range, the lower end of that range? Is demand holding strong, especially in the Asia-Pacific region? Let's start with that. Great. Well, let me start with a thank you uh, to the, the HICSA organizers, but also to all of you. We're all leaders in the travel industry, and I think filling ballrooms like this, reminding people of the power of in-person interaction is enormously valuable, so thank you. Uh, as you point out, 2022 was a remarkable year. Uh, the company set records for uh, fees, adjusted EBITDA, adjusted EPS, and remember, we achieved those numbers with a very difficult January because of the, the Omicron variant. And with China, one of our largest markets, largely locked down for 10 and a half months of the year. So our forecast for 2023 is for continued strong growth. As you point out, we gave a relatively large uh, range of RevPAR growth globally, 6 to 11%. So 100 or 200 basis points wider range than we might typically because of some of the economic uncertainty you described. But I, I was in Boston last week or two weeks ago meeting with analysts. All of them asked the right logical questions, given the interest rate environment, given inflation, given socio-political instability in certain areas of the world. Don't you see an end to this tremendous arc of recovery? And the answer is we don't see it in the data yet. Uh, the first quarter should be really, really strong when we report earnings in a few weeks. Uh, we continue to see strong forward bookings. The only caveat I would give you is for transient business, we're dealing with a relatively short booking window. So the ability to tell you forward bookings look good could change relatively quickly, but we're just not seeing it in the data yet. Well, that, that's good to hear that at least at this point in time, demand visibility right. tells you that things are still holding. Uh, I want to talk about India uh, okay. because we are here uh, and there's a lot of attention and focus on how compelling the India story is at this point in time. From Marriott's perspective, uh, you know, you had set a target of 200 hotels by 2025. I believe you're hoping to up that number. Yeah, we hope our expectation is that between open and pipeline hotels, we'll have at least 250 hotels across the country by 2025. We're in 40 cities today. That should be 50 cities or more by 2025. And maybe most exciting to me, that results in us creating 10,000 new jobs across India. You know, you talked about the pipeline in India. Uh, which end of the market do you believe uh, you are? feel that you're going to see much more sort of demand coming in? What, should, what is going to be the priority in terms of what you intend to focus on here in India? Well, I, I think in any market in the world, our development strategy is relatively simple. Our objective is to make sure we have the right product in every market our travelers want to visit for any type of, of trip purpose. I think here we've got to continue to stay focused on the domestic market, which is strong and growing. And I mentioned to you earlier, we had the, the good fortune to spend a bit of time with your tourism minister. And one of the things we talked about is the importance as an industry, and certainly from Marriott's perspective, to continue to tell the story globally about what a rich and diverse set of experiences the country offers. And we want to make sure we have lodging offerings in all of those, those destinations. You know, you talked about your meeting with the tourism minister and uh, we were just chatting uh, uh, out of the back before we came onto stage and you said that uh, India needs to lose a little bit of its humility and tell uh, its story in terms of its diversity of culture, tradition and experiences. And just like Marriott, you need to get rid of uh, some of your humility and tell your story better. How do you, how do you intend doing that? Well, I think that really relates to our culture and the opportunities that we create for our associates around the world. Uh, as you point out, one of the things I treasure about our company is our humility. But as an industry and as a company, we have an amazing story to tell about the careers 
that are created. As I've been traveling this week with our leadership team in India, we've been sharing stories about how we started in the industry. And you hear story after story about starting in hourly frontline positions. And, and just through hard work and ambition, the ability to rise. And I think it's a unique attribute of the travel and tourism sector and a story we need to tell more forcefully and more vocally. Uh, you know, I, I just want to labor a little bit more on the India connection. I yep. believe 25% of your C-suite uh, is of Indian origin. That's exactly right. Uh, Raj Menon, who runs uh, APEC region for us, uh, Satya Nan, who runs Europe, Middle East, and Africa, and Tina Edmondson, who runs our global luxury group, uh, all born and raised in India. All born and raised in India. That's good to hear. So I want to understand from you, Tony, now, uh, you know, as we look at the trends that have emerged and shaped the travel and hospitality industry post-COVID, mm -hmm. uh, which ones do you believe are less likely to be more permanent? I mean, you know, what's happened in terms of technology and the use of technology? Where do you find the balance between too much contact, too little right. contact? And I know most hospitality majors are dealing with some of these balances at this point in time. But what do you believe will be the transient changes? What do you believe are likely to be the more permanent changes? Well, I, you know, technology is an interesting topic on two fronts. I do think one of the permanent changes we'll see is an acceleration in adoption of technologies that existed long before the pandemic. So when you look at take rates for mobile check-in, mobile key, chat functionality, those, those capabilities always existed, but by necessity or by uh, a sense of apprehension early in the recovery, more and more guests are adopting those technologies, discovering the ease with which they can enable their travel, and I think that'll continue for years to come. The more impactful change, I think, is this idea of blended trip purpose. And we talked about this a little bit in our fourth quarter earnings call. The fact that Sunday and Thursday were the days of the week that recovered most quickly, I think are the, the best empirical data that support this idea that more and more travelers are blending leisure and business travel or leisure and group travel. I think that's great news for our industry, and it's a trend I expect to see continue uh, into the future. How exciting is the market from an India perspective, especially as far as things like the villas and luxury homes business is concerned? Well, it's, it is fascinating to me. Uh, for all of you and certainly for the Marriott team, 20 and 21 were the two most challenging years in the history of our business. Interestingly, they were the two strongest years in our history in the branded residential business. And so I, I'm very encouraged about the strength of our branded residential business, both co-located with hotels and on a standalone basis. Uh, just uh, Monday, we toured a spectacular project in Mumbai, and I think you'll see more and more traction for branded residential. Homes and Villas was a platform we launched, and often the question I get, did you launch that to compete with Airbnb? And the answer is no, and I'd go back to my earlier response about how we think about growing our business. I don't ever want to give one of our loyal customers, one of our loyal Bonvoy members, a reason to look outside our ecosystem. And one of the things they learned and we learned during the pandemic, for a very specific trip purpose, a multi-bedroom, full luxury home better fits their needs. Think about multi-generational travel as maybe the best example of that. The launch of homes and villas allowed us to keep that customer within the Bonvoy ecosystem. And I, th I don't think it's a coincidence that we saw our volume of listings grow by more than 20-fold over the two years of the pandemic. So is there headroom for more growth within this ecosystem? I mean, what, 31 brands and counting at this point in time, Tony? Uh, you know, what does the future look like in terms of addition? And is there any likelihood of uh, pruning the portfolio, of, of axing things that don't work, especially after that massive 2016 Starwoods acquisition? Well, you ask that question much more elegantly and politely than the analysts do, where they usually say, how can you have so many brands? Are you going to divest yourself of certain brands? And my answer is consistent because I really believe it. I think the breadth of the portfolio provides a set of choices for both our guests and our owners and franchisees that is really compelling. Um, if I felt like there was a, a brand or a set of brands in the portfolio that didn't fit in the architecture well, of course we'd consider divestiture. But nothing so far? No, and I don't see anything on the horizon. We're quite happy with the breadth of the portfolio. Um, in terms of future growth, one of the, the benefits of our industry-leading scale, 
I don't feel the need to do M&A transactions to gain additional scale. But if there is a geography mm -hmm. where we feel like we're not growing organically at the pace we would like, or a, a gap in our brand architecture, it's certainly something we'll consider. And if you look at our history, clearly the Starwood transaction tends to dominate those, those headlines. But I think we've had a, a very well-balanced uh, strategy of adding some brands through M&A and adding some brands organically, and that has served us well. Uh, you know, so what kind of appetite do you have for growth at this point in time inorganically and specifically in a market like India? Is that likely to be a strategy that you want to consider? Well, I, without question, there is a long runway of opportunity for luxury in India. I think we're in our infancy of growing our, our industry-leading luxury portfolio here. Um, that's probably an area where we'll continue to look to, to grow our footprint.